Welcome to Kiss the Reviews. I'm Armando, that's Corey, and today we're doing 1995's The Brady Bunch Movie. Before we get started, if you want to reach out to me or Corey and follow us on Twitter, you can follow me at Junior D's, you can follow Corey at Corey underscore Idol, and if you want to follow the show, you can follow the show at Kiss the Reviews on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, and let's get into the cast, because it's a long one. Of 1995's The Brady Bunch Movie. I'm going to go. I'll, you call me when you're done, all right, bro? I got some shit to do. I got to run gotcha. a couple errands. I got gotcha. you. So this film stars Shelley Long as Carol Brady, Gary Cole as Mike Brady, Christine Taylor as Marsha Brady, Christopher Daniel Barnes as Greg Brady, Jennifer Elise Cox as Jan Brady, Paul Sutera as Peter Brady, Olivia Hack as Cindy Brady, Jesse Lee Soffer as Bobby Brady, Henriette Mantle as Alice Nelson, and Michael McKean as Mr. Larry Dittmeyer, with cameos from the original cast. I won't go into the original cast. Florence Henderson's the only one you really need to know, and she comes in at the end as, as Grandmama. Not Larry Johnson, but the Brady's Grandmama. <laughs> Sweet. I felt like I was at the DMV right there. <laughs> number 52 52 we're getting closer i'm only number 152 <laughs> so okay i'm gonna start this review off by saying this whoever um was like the casting director of this movie did a fantastic job mm. front to back every single character was perfectly cast in this movie like everybody Facts. did a perfect job with the character that they had from the original show um number two i love the concept of this movie this movie <laughs> listen this movie's silly as hell it's you know it's not your your typical comedy that we would normally review but the concept of the very 70s Brady's mm -hmm. in the transported somehow or never got outside of their like 70s everything. And now they're in like the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. is such a great concept. No, it really is. And we have reviewed movies. It's, it's following almost like the SNL line of movies yeah. like night at the roxbury where there are club guys outside of the club they can't yeah. stop being that or like the coneheads yeah you know what i mean like everybody else around you are the straight people and you are the oddball yep and that's where all the comedy is derived from yeah no i really enjoyed it if this was if this was set in the 70s and they tried to just be cheeky and being the Brady Bunch with like the adult innuendo attached to it, yeah, it wouldn't have played nearly as well. It had to be this. You're you're absolutely right, and and that's what. And if they did it that way, I don't think I would have liked the movie. No, it would have just been like oh, another like corny Brady something. <laughs> yeah, like the Brady Bunch was never my classic TV watching to choose from like i was always more of an all in, all in the family kind of guy like that we're happy and you know it clap your hands family bullshit i never was into ever ever see Corey, ever. when you grow up like you did in a very happy family like you don't really gravitate towards those happy family shows if you grow up yeah. outside of that and that's all you aspire to be is one of the Brady Bunch, you, you, you tend to gravitate towards those shows more. <laughs> like that yeah. and Family Matters and like some of these other like, everything's happy. So you're telling me that poor people didn't like good times the same way I liked good times? <laughs> oh no, poor people love good times. My, okay. my, my family loved good times. It was, it was a good time. Okay, because we enjoyed, maybe it was just we were laughing at different things. Is it possible this story is true? Yes, it is. So let's jump into this movie. So the movie opens 
in present day 1995 with Larry Dittmeyer. He's on the phone in LA traffic talking to his boss about building a mall in a residential neighborhood. And all of the families have agreed to sell their homes except for one family. Who could it be? Yeah, it's, it's a good way to intro the movie, and I would like to take this moment because nobody's really suggested many movies with him in it. Like, can we give Michael McKeon his due respect? A hundred percent is a fucking legend. I will die on that hill. I'm Anybody with you. who wants to come at me with him, with uh, negative thoughts about Mike, you got problems. <laughs> no, I'm I'm right there with you. If whether it's I mean, and he's been doing it and he did it for, uh, I don't even know how many years. I mean, from Spinal Tap to like all of the movies with all those guys, Spinal Tap, A Mighty Wind, like all of those. Best in show. Best in show. Yeah. Like all of those movies. And he's just, he's a killer. Yeah. And then he goes on something like uh, Better Call Saul and drops drama on your ass. And you're like, wait a second. Yes. That's not what you're supposed to do. And no, he's and, amazing. And we can't forget about Laverne and Shirley. I mean, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> we also after, you know, his little piece, we get intro to the Brady Bunch. And immediately right off the bat, we get all the callbacks from the original episodes and plot lines and they basically and this is what I mean by like how good of a job they did. They mm-hmm. literally took all of the the biggest plot lines, you know, mm-hmm. Marsha getting hit in the face with the, with the football, Jan's psychoness about being the middle child, like yeah. all of that stuff. And they just went and they just squished it all into, into one movie. And it was so well written that it didn't seem out of place. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Not at all. They did a fantastic job taking the individual storylines through however many years this show ran. Yeah. And even for a neophyte like myself, who was not a fan of the show, I knew those episodes. I knew yeah. Marsha got hit in the nose with the football. I knew Jan was psycho and came up with, you know, what was the guy's name? Carl Glass or whatever the fuck <laughs> as her pseudo boyfriend. And yeah. all of this crazy shit that happens in the show they did a phenomenal job of making it just a small little individual package where you were like, Oh yeah, I I heard about that. Or, Oh, I remember that if you were an actual fan. Yeah. And even down to the overall, the, like the a plot in this movie, which is them getting a letter that they owe 20 grand in back taxes by the end of the week, or they're going to lose their house to auction. And when they're talking, when Carol and Mike, are talking and Shelly Long does such does such a good yeah. job in this movie too. And she her little piece and her line. But we used our savings to go to the Grand Canyon in Hawaii. So they even bring up like the yep. little vacation episodes. Um, and even down to in the kitchen, and I don't even know if you noticed this, there's a little chalkboard in the kitchen in the back, and it just says pork chops and applesauce. Mm-hmm. Like just the little stuff in the background that they threw in was it was all brilliantly done. No, they did a phenomenal job. And again, this is a credit, I think, to the actors here, Shelley Long, Gary Cole, and even all the kids. They did such a phenomenal job of staying in that character the whole time and and again credit to the writers who we all know are the real heroes in any major production (laughs) um they they were able to make it so the outside world literally did not affect them yeah like even down to the carjacking yes oh he needs a jack for his car (laughs) you know what i mean like that just wasn't something that happened back then It was so smart and so intelligent and carrying it over to the end of the movie like they do. Yes. Was brilliant again. Like, it really played like a long episode of The Brady Bunch. Yeah. Especially, like you said, with the A plot of how are we going to get this money? The magical $20,000 we love on this show. Yep, absolutely. How are we going to come up with the $20,000? And again... Even taking a piss on that, because that was such a trope in these old sitcoms. 
Yeah. Where, oh no, our favorite hangout spot is in trouble. What are we going to do to save it? Whether it was fucking Al's Diner, the goddamn Peach Pit, <laughs> the fucking bowling alley in Laverne and Shirley, it didn't fucking matter. They all had trouble at some point, yep. and they had to magically found a contest for just the right of dollar amount. You were right. It, it goes back and forth here in this middle piece. So it goes to Dittmeyer, who goes back to Mike Brady. He tries to get him to sell the house again, but to no avail. And then after the attempted carjacking, Marsha and Greg get to school where Greg hits on his crush, Donna, and Marsha gets asked to the dance by her crush, Doug, who's like one of the popular kids in school. And she already said yes to somebody else. I, I got one thing here, and this is what I noticed. So mm-hmm. they, they set up this movie and... You know, they're you know in the 70s and everybody's looking at them like, what, what a weirdo. And they're dressing with the butterfly collar and the bell bottoms. And then Marsha gets to school. I'm going to tell you this. Women's 70s dress, I don't think it ever really, outside of like pastels and like that, but like the style mm. of dress never went out of style. <laughs> No, it didn't. Even the pastels were just like you—you you were a niche girl, or yeah. I because I thought the exact same thing. Like the guys in the seventies fashion. I think we've talked about this on some other shows, but some of these people on the uh, some of these guys in the other in these other movies we've had to review have just gotten straight fucked by their yeah. fashion and the women's fashion. Even Jan with her, yeah. you know, kind of weird little uh, her cardigan fucking, sweaters and her, her smocks. <laughs> yeah. It all works still. She's just, yeah. she's the nerdy girl. That's how yeah. the nerd girls would still dress if they have a little taste of fashion or we're quirky like Zoe Deschanel and play the ukulele. So it's kind of not that big of a deal. But yeah, the guys, holy shit, do they stand out like sore thumbs, dude. A hundred percent. And it's and it's funny because even in this movie, the kids that they go to school with, like all the alt-rock kids and, and yada mm-hmm. yada, they're like, oh my God, look at Greg. Look at like they're dorks. Like who dresses like that? And then they look at Marsha, and even though she like doesn't fit in because personality wise she just doesn't fit in, they refer to her and how she dresses as like oh she thinks she's cool because it's like throwback clothing. It's they look at the different kids so differently. Like all the girls are like especially Marsha. What a retro wannabe. The only cool uh, rip is. Um, what Whitmire or Dittmeyer says to Cindy. So why don't you hop back on the Swiss Miss package where you belong, huh? Okay. I, I know we're going to find this shocking, but I found Cindy to be the most annoying character by far. Um, Which go, goes back to the casting because she was also oh, the most annoying character in the show. Exactly. They did a fantastic job of it. Yeah. Her playing up that list was brilliant. <laughs> I, I don't understand you. What do you want? Mom asked me to ask you if there's any mail for us here by mistake. What? The joke that he can't understand anything she says whenever she talks to him is fucking fantastic. <laughs> it's so mean, but that's who I am. So I enjoyed oh, it. I'm, no. I'm here for it. If I see anything that has a couple S's in it, I am immediately adopting a lisp. Jan then, they show Jan in the school counselor's office, which the school counselor is RuPaul, and they discuss the middle child syndrome, and, which obviously is, you know, again, taking that one episode or a few of those episodes, mm-hmm. and it's like, now, and I like how they did this, because now it's just, Jan's a psycho. She's hearing voices. Like, they, they took this to just outer space with it. They were like, oh, okay, she's got issues. But let's make her psychotic. <laughs> yeah, the the actor that played Jan was phenomenal. Yeah. And she was by far and away my favorite character in this. Yes. Because she she brought the funny and didn't fucking stop. Yep. Like her care her facial expressions, her mannerisms when she walked. Yeah. Everything she did was phenomenal. It was. It was really good. I I enjoyed her 
her performance throughout this movie. It was great. Mm -hmm. And then, and the one thing that I I liked about this too, because, you know, Mike Brady's the architect and yada, yada. And even his architecture is still stuck in the seventies and he just keeps designing his house as everything. So he's trying to get the advance from his boss and he's like, Oh, I'll get an advance. If I sell my designs, the boss is like, ah, you know, we'll see. So they bring in all these people and nobody buys his designs. It's literally just his house with a different sign on the top for every design. Like I thought that was the trees. (laughs) Well, and it's brilliant because they, they bring this back with the neighbors because the Mm -hmm. neighbors are complaining about them. And then they're like, yeah, I've been to their house, one bathroom, nine people. Like all they do is, and you know, comedians have been making fun of this since the show was on the air and originally airing that yeah. Mike Mike Brady is an architect who designed one bathroom for the whole house. After he gets back home, Mike and Carol talk about having to possibly sell their home to cover the back taxes. And Cindy overhears this. She goes to tell Greg. Greg then calls a kids meeting with all the kids in the house and they decide that they're going to get jobs to save the house. This is literally why I do not breed. Fucking yes. kids meetings. You're holding players old new meetings like you're the struggling New York <laughs> Knicks. Get the fuck out of here. That's so ridiculous. What, so what I love about the the shows back then, and again, there was, you know, a lot of naive kids and, you know, whatever in adult situations trying to, you know, navigate their way through. What I found hysterical about this and about those shows back then was so you have this a very adult situation, twenty thousand dollars in taxes. So Cindy, the little one, who like the two little ones, yeah, let's get jobs and help mom and dad because they have no concept of what twenty thousand dollars is. But like Marsha and Greg are like seniors in high school, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we'll get a job, and I'm gonna be Johnny Bravo, and I'm gonna be a rock star, and that's how in a week. Like, that's how stupid these kids are. And I fucking loved that they just leaned into that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how stupid the show was. <laughs> yes. Like, I can do it. I'm Greg Brady. Watch what I can pull off. And it's like, no. In real life, you knew you're not pulling this off. Yes. Only on a fucking TV show do you just pick up a guitar and like, hey, ladies, I'm Johnny Bravo. <laughs> and like, you get panties thrown at you. It doesn't happen in real life. You get restraining no. orders thrown at you quicker than you get fucking panic thrown at you. A hundred percent. Well, and then he takes his like tiny little amp and then goes to like the record label <laughs> to try to get signed. And again, going back to the out of date, like the song he writes. Clowns never laughed before and beanstalks. No. Brilliantly written really hilarious and then the original greg brady is like the record exec here then jan and marcia go to a modeling agency to try to get hired as teen models i loved this scene this scene is really good i did dig this scene them putting on like the barbazon old fucking lifestyles of the rich and famous music while they <laughs> on the, were doing on the real to real yes <laughs> holy shit i was fucking dead yeah no, this was this was great. And then when all the kids get back together, they pool their money and I think they raise like a hundred bucks. Which, by the way, back for back then, like in '95, if you raised a hundred bucks, like that's pretty damn good. I mean, it's not twenty grand, but they raised like a oh, no, hundred bucks. Is, this is right in the middle, like the prime fifty nine, sixty nine, seventy nine set menu at Taco Bell. Yes, a hundred bucks was a fuckload of money bro you you're you buying buy the baseball cards for 50 cents dog you could buy a taco bell franchise for 100 bucks back then <laughs> well that's technically i think you still can so they all get together they pool their money they haven't raised enough jan mentions that she saw an ad on the bulletin board at school for a search for the stars contest where first prize is twenty thousand dollars and the kids all, just shit all over her idea immediately Again, going back to Jan being a psycho, as soon as she opens her mouth about everything throughout this movie, everybody Mm -hmm. just takes a huge dump on her and they move on with their day. (laughs) 
Yeah, I really related to her in this because I wasn't the middle child, but I was the stupid child. <laughs> so every time I opened my mouth, it was just like, yo, shut the fuck up. Like I tried to build like the Back to the Future time machine once for my science fair project because I thought <laughs> movies were real. I was not a smart child. Nor was I. I'm Nor not a was smart I. adult either. I've basically never been intelligent has been my problem. It happens. It happens go, to the best of us. Go past. And what happens when you put two of those guys together on one YouTube show? You get a mediocre YouTube show. <laughs> so Doug had asked Jan to the school dance. She makes an excuse that she can't go with the other dude who asked her. So Doug picks Jan up for the school dance, takes her to park and tries to get fresh with her. And when she declines his advances, Doug just kicks her out of the car and leaves and then Marsha's now stranded and she sees a limo drive up looking for directions to her school. And I would say, you know, for most guys out there who like, maybe she means yes. It's like, no, she meant no. And this is the best option. <laughs> there's two options. One may, just makes you an asshole. I mean, there's, there's really like three options. One makes you a criminal. One makes you an asshole. And one just makes you like a decent person. This option, always, middle of the road is always where I stay, friend. Yeah. So the asshole option is get out of my car. I'm leaving, and you leave her up in the hills where there's like mountain lions and shit. Dude, That's the asshole. Davy Jones. That's the moral of this story. <laughs> That's very true. We get to the dance. They show everybody at the dance here. Bobby's dancing with the the redhead, and she's into him. And Marsha gets there finally, and she goes up to Charlie. She starts dancing with him. That's when Davy Jones shows up, and he does his little thing here. And nobody knows who the fuck he is, which I find absolutely hilarious. It's only like the teachers. The teachers all like storm the stage. <laughs> That part was fantastic. All the all the female teachers storming the stage was brilliant. Yes. I hate. I don't care if it's a comedy or what the situation is. Yeah. I fucking hate the, hey, what's that dance? Let's all do it. I went to school for so many years. Like. 30 years I spent in school and never once did anybody ever start the group dance that yeah. the whole dance followed. Even the electric slide had people doing different shit in it. You were right. After this, we get more psycho dreams from Jan. Mike finally sells one of his designs to the owner of like a gym and the Brady's get the money to pay their taxes and Carol hey! and Mike. Yay. And Carol and Mike tell the kids the good news and they put their Sunday best on and go to Sears where they sing and dance through the store. That was fucking hilarious. Put on your Sunday best, kids. We're going to Sears. <laughs> this is a, from, from this 95 for I don't even know how long, this was probably one of the most quoted lines for a while. A lot of people said this. Oh, shit. yeah. So let's celebrate. Put on your Sunday best, kids. We're going to Sears. Dittmeyer then actually gets the final notice for the Brady's tax situation. And it, the house is going to be going up for auction the next day. So he goes to confront Mike Brady about it. Mike tells him that he's paying the taxes with the design that he sold. So Dittmeyer just goes and tries to sabotage the whole deal between the gym and Mike Brady. Can I just do this? I know we're in a sure. comedy and this needed to be done because we <laughs> have to have something happen. Da, 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 da. Corey's Life Lessons. Hello, businessmen. Uncle Corey here. If somebody shows up and is like, oh, no, I can help you with your building. Who's your architect here? Oh, that guy? He's a fucking drunk. Do some fucking research, <laughs> you fucking idiots. This guy just showed up off the street, and he's like, here's a business card. That guy's a drunk. Cool, I guess. Don't take their word for it and just fire the fucking guy. That's insane. Well, and he made up his life and he made up like he didn't even say like he's a drunk. He was like, this guy's got felonies, charges, criminal negligence, a building he designed completely collapsed. Old folks home Christmas Day. 
Did you not see his teardrop tattoo? And it was like like a lot of baseless claims. <laughs> Like, yeah, like this guy, you know this guy beat Rodney King, right? Like, you could literally, one phone call could clear up this whole thing. And he was like, you know what? You seem like a very honest man. I'm totally buying into everything you're saying. Mike Brady, you're out of here. Right. And but by the way, why we're on the subject of the businessmen and the gym and all that stuff. Corey's Life Lessons. Hi, filmmakers. Uncle Corey here. You're probably not getting away with it anyway, but just in case you think you can, every time something happens with an Asian on screen, you don't have to do the gong <laughs> to let us know that they're Asian. Consider yourself hired. We can fucking see it. Thanks, Chief. End of PSA. Mike then here goes and tells his family that they have to sell the house. And as the house is packed up, Marsha mentions to the other kids that they need to enter this search for the stars contest. And everybody's like, yeah, Marsha, that's a great fucking idea. You're the, you're the coolest. <laughs> so great. So Jan gets mad at this because no one listens to her. So she runs away. The family then hits the road to find Jan. Carol uses her CB radio in their station wagon to try to find her. And Jan is in a truck with a trucker, Ann B. Davis. And they hear the CB transmission and the trucker takes Jan back home. And all is well when the Brady Bunch gets back home and everybody hugs and kisses it out. First off, I love the fact that because Jan's guidance counselor was RuPaul with some big ass drag queen hair. Jan went out and bought the fucking black goddamn <laughs> arc the, of an afro. The, the Angela Davis wig. <laughs> uh, even Angela Davis was like, Jesus Christ. That, that was, I'm glad you brought this up because RuPaul, as the counselor says to her, like, you know, it's middle child syndrome. You got to like, you know, step out and be your own person and be different, yada, yada. And literally the next scene is her with the big Angela Davis afro wig. The thing but, was a massive. But, but she's still got the little blonde curls coming out the front. <laughs> like, it's not even put on right. No. It's so good. And then when she runs away, like, you think when you're watching this movie for the first time, like, oh, okay, this is a bit. She's trying to be different, yada, yada. And then they show her in the truck with the trucker, and she's got it back on again. <laughs> And she's just doing the thing with her eyes, like not blinking and just kind of staring back and forth and sitting. Oh, my God. dude, She yeah. was so good in this movie. I looked her yes. up, uh, the actor, and I couldn't find it in many other comedies that she's been in. And I don't understand why, because she was yeah. fucking great. No, nah, she was she was fantastic in this. She was absolutely fantastic in this. And then after she gets back home. You know, the family was like, yeah, let's go for the, you know, Ed McMahon's star search and go on there and win our mm. 20 grand. So they go out there. You have other people performing like alt rock stuff. And then they get out with their goddamn 70s fringe and tassels and shit. They perform their corny ass song and they win the contest because the judges are Davy Jones and another two other members from the Monkees. <laughs> To which, again, was another great twist as to how they could possibly win this. Well, and you have the host, Eric Nice from The Real World. And even he does a decent job here because after they perform, like, he comes out and he was like, the Brady Bunch? Like, cool. And then when he gets the thing and he announces the winners, he was like, what the hell? Like, how the fuck did they win 20 grand? The Brady Bunch? Eric Nice reminded me that there was a moment in time, a brief moment in time, where Joe Rogan and Eric Nice were the same exact person. <laughs> and then they just went like that. Like ships in a night. After the performance, and they win their 20 grand, and they got their giant check, their nemesis, Eric, cuts the wires to their car so they can't get to the auction of their house. And, and we need to... we. No pun intended, we need to pump the brakes here a second, because Eric goes very far in what, like, his dad said, stop them from getting here. Yes. And he's like, cool, I'm going to cut their brakes. 
Like, I don't we're know. supposed to think Jan is the psycho? Like, I know we were fucked up as kids in the 90s, but God damn. Eric, I don't know that, I don't know lot. that he, he cut their, like, I don't even know that he knew what the fuck he was doing. He was like, oh, there's a bunch of wires down here. We're just going to zip, <laughs> cut yeah. those. Slash a tire. They already said they don't have a jack in their car. That would have played. Very true. How Very you write true. a movie, guys. You don't fucking set them up to fucking die and possibly <laughs> kill other people. This is nuts. Oh, Doyle rules. <laughs> yeah, no shit, fucking psycho Eddie Vedder. You need to take a chill. While, while they're trying to figure out what they're doing, they see the carjacker from earlier, and they go up to him, the cops show up, and they get a police escort to the auctioning of their house while Dittmeyer is trying to buy the said house at auction. Mm -hmm. And they show up with, you know, their giant check and like, the taxes are paid. Okay, I got a quick don't do that here. <laughs> okay. Listen up, Wesley Snipes. Don't do that, it's not good for you. Hi, literally everybody. Cause y'all pay taxes when you get money, okay? Um, at least some of you do, or should anyway. But when you get a giant check, we learned this in like Happy Gilmore. The giant checks, A, you can't cash. So don't do that. Don't try to cash that. Don't try to use that as legal tender. It's not going to work. But B, this isn't how taxes are paid. If your house is up for auction, it's just up for auction. You don't go, I got a giant check for 20 grand to pay the taxes. And they're like, cool, the house is yours again. <laughs> It's, you're wrong again, bro. That's you're not how this shit works. That's not how shit works for you poor people. <laughs> when you're rich and white and you have a police escort, they're just like, taxes are paid. Uh -huh. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you for this cardboard paper that's worthless. We'll take it. Everyone off the, the way, lawn. Off the lawn. And by the way, the reason that they don't pay their taxes is because the mailman keeps fucking up the mail between the two houses. Why isn't this dude fired? He's terrible at his job. Terrible. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So, no, it's kind of the entire reason the movie happens. I think it's here. <laughs> it's very much here. Might not be there, but it's fucking here. And we never and see the, the mailman. We never see him either. Fucking government worker. This is why we rioted. <laughs> Nobody's listening. Oh my god! I so, just realized how scary that may have looked with my haircut and my mustache. Yeah, don't get, I don't get that. I was teasing. I was teasing. I was totally teasing. So, the, yeah, don't get that aggressive and that close to the camera. It's just not a good look. Um, Can't help it, bro. I'm but, angry. They're taking my, my country, and nobody's listening to me. But Mike Brady here then gives another speech, one of his many speeches in this movie, mm. to the angry neighbors about how important their the neighbors are to them and to each other, how important the community is. And the neighbors all then decide that they're going to stay in the neighborhood along with the Bradys, and they're going to sue Dittmeyer. And the movie ends when they go to visit their grandma, played by Florence Henderson. And this is probably the best cameo in mm -hmm. the movie because Jan starts doing her psycho shit. And Florence Henderson, very out of character for Florence Henderson. Jan! Cut the crap. <laughs> it's amazing. And I think yes. they probably did that because Florence Henderson is the only one left alive that can still actually act. So she got the most flying. <laughs> yeah, very true. Her and Ann B. Davis. Like the kids, they were just like, just say a line and, yeah, thanks for coming. You're a legend. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Next you're run. A, you're a legend. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude. I mean, I. all in all, man, again, this is a super silly film. It, yes. If you're in that, if you're in that mindset, and you're like, dude, I just need something super simple, silly. This is, this is a great movie to watch. And especially oh, yeah, if this, you watched the show ever. This is right in line for me with most of those 90s films. The Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore. We've talked about the other ones that it's like Night at the Roxbury, etc. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very much 
are you in the mood for it kind of movie for me. But there is literally nothing wrong with this. Uh, the one thing I would have changed, what I thought would have been funny, is if they actually just decided, like, fuck these neighbors, you're all a bunch of dicks. We don't fit in here. And they actually did move into Utah, and they're totally normal. Yeah. Because this just, rem all it reminded me of now, like back when I was a kid, girl coming up, even as a dirtbag in uh, trash bag Arizona, I never really understood Mormon families. Yeah. Which is odd, because I grew up in Arizona. But as I said, I was a trash bag, and they were very clean. So we did not intersect very often. But now, watching this, it's just like, oh, they're kind of like a Mormon family just set in 1990s L.A. Yeah. Like, that's literally uh, it. it a, monogamous, a monogamous Mormon family. <laughs> yeah. Which I know two of those. Well, here's, here's my thing. What I, what I would have loved, because I love your idea, and my rewrite would have been the family moves to Waco, Texas, and starts a little church. <laughs> And Mike Brady becomes David Koresh. Okay. Darker. Definitely darker. Darker. Uh, I, and FYI, more of a spoiler alert because we knew what happens now. <laughs> Jan started the fire. It wasn't the ATF. It was fucking Jan. Absolutely. Actually, holy shit. Jan. Janet Reno. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. Did we just write this fucking sequel? She, she Holy left. Shit. She left the church, got a job in the government. Yep. And then she was like, "They're like, oh, David Koresh," and she's like, "God damn it, that's that's my stepdad I'm and his an family." She's like, "Marsha, Marsha, Marsha, start a fire." <laughs> so it was the ATF <laughs> ordered by Jan Net Reno. Jan, yes, Jan and Reno. her man, and she tried to blame her man on the scene. Field agent Carl Glass. There you go. Bada boom, bada bing. Bada boom, bada bing. There's that's, your sequel. That's how that's how soup is made, kids. Welcome to the kitchen. <laughs> oh, by the way, that movie idea better than knockoff. <laughs> oh, that's better than like ninety five percent of the J JCVD movies we've watched. Absolutely. Uh, but that, that's all I got. I really enjoyed this movie. So thanks for the request. Yeah, no, it actually, I, I thought going into it, I was not going to like it at all. And I really did enjoy it. I laughed Same. out loud a few times. Yeah. I really, I really enjoyed this movie. Probably a lot more, honestly, than I would if I had to revisit Adam Sandler movies at this point. I don't know that I agree with that, but I got you. I've just never been an Adam guy. He was I, never my guy. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't have anything else in this movie. Do you have anything? Uh, no. All right, cool. Well, for Corey, I'm Armando. This is Kiss the Reviews, and this was 1995's The Brady Bunch Movie.